Well, thank you very much, John, and good morning to everyone. Nice to see you all again. So it's really a great opening to it by John, but I'm not going to be talking about this time for anyone from this morning. But it's good to be here. Last time I was here, I spoke to you about revival. And revival only begins when we have revival in our own heart and in our own life. And so I would trust that between us, and now, that you've looked at your life and you've discovered many things that God wants you to come at. Maybe there are things that you can do to become involved with if you're not involved in at this point in time. So there are many things that can stop us looking at our own revival and maybe looking toward the revival that we would love to see God bring to this community. I want you to understand that it doesn't happen unless we ourselves are in a right relationship with God. That our lives are focused on what He wants and His will for our lives. Over the past couple of weeks, there have been three people that have died back in the population that I've known. And those people are people that belong to the family. And as a result, those families have been devastated. So what is it that helps them to continue on in life? Maybe you are in a position where you have lost the loved It could be that maybe you're a grandparent and you see some of your grandchildren going the wrong way and you'd love to be able to say something to them. But what is the future for them? What is the future for you as we think about how we bring about things in our lives to be able to do the things that God wants us to do. How do we cope with the ups and the downs of life and move forward? There is a famous author, a world-renowned author, who has written 24 books. Some of them you may have even read. But this author was a very well-known man and did some great things in writing Christian books. When he reached the age of 50, he was a psychologist. He was a theologian, and he was also an author, and he lost the travel. On one occasion, when he returned home, he discovered that he'd lost the love of his life. His wife had got tired of him traveling and being away all the time, and she had found somebody else. So how did he do in those situations? This man took the alcohol, and he got deeper and deeper into the alcohol. And for 10 years, he was living what he called a lost life. At the end of 10 years, he was a drunkard, he lost most of his money, he had no future as far as he could see. He was a lost soul. And so what he did, he went and he read one of his own books that he was written. And he said it opened up a whole new horizon for him that he thought he had never heard of before. Such is the people contained in that book. So he held the power to be able to go on. He said over the years, I so he said, the only surprise to me in a very sudden and profound way. He said, as he was kneeling down, God spoke to him in a way that he had spoken to him before. He said, it seemed like God was in the very room that he was in 15 years ago. And he didn't reach it, but he put in a question mark. And the answer that God gave was not an answer. God said to him, Word and Word. What would you do with the rest of your life? What would you do with the rest of your life? And that's the question that I want us to preach on today. What will we do? With the rest of our life. 
often we get challenges week by week from the pulpit. We get challenges as we read God's word. We get challenges as we talk with other Christians. It doesn't make a difference in that way. Do we seek to allow God to work in our lives at that deep level, or does it kind of just blow our lives and we continue to move in the same direction? God wants to see things in our lives. In this man, we've gone out, gone out to the room and we've got a good voice. He said, for the next two years, he said to me, and he told me to do it, about how to do the job, to change the direction of his life. In other words, how to do the thing in life over the years. You know, that's pretty clear for the sake of the people. The question that God asked him, what are you going to do with it? Now, the more I thought about that, the more penetrating I believe that question is. Because if you take that to heart, you have to understand that when you're looking at what you will do with the rest of your life from this day forward, however many years we have left, what will you do and what will I do with the rest of our life? It means that we have to look back to where we came from. It means we have to look at where we are and what we're doing now. But we have to look forward to what God wants for us to be involved in from here on until the Christmas of the Jesus Christ. The Jesus is here today. The Jesus is the last to be. The Jesus is the to be. The Jesus is the to be. I wonder if you have gone to the place of God. Maybe you've been caught up in an immoral lifestyle. Maybe you have been a person or a person. Maybe you have lost a habit, a home, or a car. Maybe somebody has mistreated you and as a result, you want to be back to those people. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Do you have feelings that you have been done badly by? Do you have a question this morning? We have a reading from Genesis of Jacob. Jacob is a very interesting character. His name means the painter or a cheater. He cheated his brother out of his birthright. He also cheated his brother out of his father's birthright. And then, as a result of that, he went away into a far country to his mother's brother, to Laban. And then she spent the next 20 years working for Laban, for his wife, and for his animals. And then God said to him, He said, I want you to return home. And so Jacob said it, looking at how he could go back to his own country. Back to Esau, who he had fallen the his life on, who he stole and he had him on. And he determined in his own mind that he was going to go back. But he knew that Esau still had some animosity to do with his life. So as a result of that, the story unfolds that Jacob began to go back and send some people to talk to him, so I came back and said that he had 400 men that he was coming to do it for Jacob was. So Jacob did the number of things. He divided his animals up, he divided his servants up, and he sent them all in separate lines and identity groups. And they all were confronted by his pictures that he had his son. But then finally, he took his finger and he pulled and he placed them on the other side of the river to take it to the mountain. And it was there that he saw that he didn't see on the side. So that Jacob had an encounter with an angel. Some Bibles study the version study that it was a man. 
so it's so beautiful for a person to experience God leading and protecting. You see, we're all pretty strong world people. We all want to do our own thing. But God is the only thing that has been done in this world. Remember the chorus? When we allow God to be our in our life, when we recognize that He sent Jesus Christ to die for us, and we are to accept Him as our Savior and Lord, we are given a new name. We are called Christians. And that name means Christ in us. So we become different people. We can move forward in life knowing that Jesus Christ lives and reigns within us. And that we allow him to do a lot of things to unfold in the world. This is really the first All we want to do is that. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. In all his past to reign, all things have become new. I think I've mentioned to you before about my mentor, the wonderful man. He was a man who was full of wisdom and understanding. And he was one who died in my life, which is what he had. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to do today. This man's name was Elvis Rutherford. He was a wonderful storyteller. He was a great footballer, played real football, I believe. And he also was a radio man. He had his own radio and uh, he told a story about some young people who were at and maybe just happened to be James over the last few days, where they had a great fire burning. And he said, this man who was the leader in the camp took a big pair of tongs and he reached into the fire and he pulled out a big coal which was red hot and laid it on a rock in front of all of the young people as they were standing around him. And he just watched him. And no one can go to the house to lose his life. And as he was in the office of the priest of Paul, he looked around at his disease and young people, and he said, This is my office. This is my office. This is my office.
that's the sign that it was truly honest. We need to be out there and say, well, that's what you think you do. And we need to be contented. Oh, I'm going to say, well, this is what I do. Well, I'm going to say, 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 well, I'm going to